Collaboration is beneficial in most organizations. Our channel and our job as officials thrive off of collaboration. It is how we analyze plays that allow us to work together to become better officials. However, when you utilize plays without context, when it is accessible to them, or refuse to ask for information on plays and just grab them from our channel, it lessens the opportunity for further development and interacting with people potentially involved in both situations. In both the clips that the San Antonio Basketball Officials Association are known as SEBOA took from us, I was involved both as a referee or a coach, which could have been added to the conversation. That perspective opens up more learning and adds to the discussion. Secondly, they analyze only part of the clip and not the whole clip. In one case, they miss the whole point of the play. We will look at both clips that were analyzed by Seboa and NBA referees Eric Luce and Rodney Mott. They open up the discussion with this U Sport game, which is a university game in Canada. Ironically, they watermark the top left corner of both videos from my channel. In this video, I end up being the center referee, which is at the top of the screen currently in the trail position. As a crew, we miss two hits that occur in transition, then we miss a huge foul in the, in the front court. They discuss the center official missing the first contacts in transition, which is completely correct. What they missed is the lead rotation during a shot that compromised the whole crew rotation. I am the trail, and when the shot is rebounded, I quickly run to lead. The center, who is at the bottom of the screen, stays with the play and picks up the rotation right before the contact. He then runs to lead right after contact occurs. I see him running to lead and notice the rotation hang back after the contact. This one bad rotation, initiated by lead, on a shot attempt has caused both outside officials to be in the wrong position and we both missed the first contacts that started this whole play. That is a huge portion to notice that was not discussed. As referees, we are, supposed to, we are not supposed to force a rotation on a shot attempt because of this situation. The crew can miss the rotation and have us miss plays because we're in the wrong spots. If we grab this contact and have a foul, the second obvious contact would not have occurred. The U foul that occurred has no excuse for being missed. The lead and trail are unfocused. Trail is definitely ball watching, and me as center has six matchups with the ball on my side. However, this has been broken down in full by both Rodney Mott and Eric Lewis, who are both NBA officials. You can find Eric's breakdown at the end of my portion of the video of my two plays in the third play, if interested. Clip two is about a made basket not being inbounded. In this clip, I am the coach of the DMCI team, which is the maroon color. We score a basket and the other team, white, does not inbound the ball and went full court to score. No fouls were called on either play and at no point during the whole play did they mention the ball not being inbounded. During that whole discussion, not one person said, hey, how come they didn't inbound the ball? They also said a foul was called at the other end when no foul was actually called, so I don't know what call they're speaking upon. If they actually watched the whole video from my channel, they would see the emphasis on the play, but clearly they only watched the first portion, portion, recorded it, and then missed the video saying why it was an atypical play. Attached is the whole Zoom video breakdown. There is plenty of valuable information here. It is important to collaborate as a community of officials so that way we can grow this game together. Wouldn't it be best to just go double foul? Yes. My basketball IQ is telling me that if this offensive player is pushing off, the defender did something. So for me, I would go double foul if I saw the tail end of this play. Exactly. I, the, the offensive player does, does not have a reason, reason to push off at all. She's just running up the court. So your basketball IQ will tell you she's reacting to something that's happened to her. Great points. I mean, absolutely great points. So now we missed that. We have no idea what's happening now. Um, pause it. Like right now, if I'm in slot, I'm not worried about the basketball. I'm picking up matchups and I'm picking up players' demeanors as I go down, down the court. So if I'm the slot, I would try to pick up the demeanor of those players. And if I see, um, a player just like beeline towards, towards another player or ball their fist up. Um, you know, those are tails for me. When I say a tails or signs, 
that something happened and that player is getting ready to retaliate. So I try to get to that play or those players really quick uh, before that happens. So, so if White right now, if I see her getting ready to take off towards Green or if she, her fist are balled up, I'm going to hit my whistle because I see her fist balled up and I'm going to go directly toward the woman with the fist balled up. So right now she doesn't do that. Um, here, pause it. Slot has six players on his side. Right now, the trail should not be looking at the slot, should be looking at the players engaging at the top of the key. And the lead, as the lead rotates, the lead should be looking up through, ready to rotate to that side, picking up the new matchups. So really, the player at the top of the key, lead and trail should have some kind of focus there. So now white retaliates. That's that to me is more than an offensive foul. That would be a flagrant one, or or if you have intentional or something like that, two shots in the ball. But here you can see the lead head was there, the trail head is there, but for some reason they don't have a whistle. I'm not sure why. Because it, Eric, sometimes sometimes with high school officials and you know, small college officials, from what we have found is that, and I know this is, this is an extreme, but they feel like, well, we may have missed something on this side. We're just going to let this go as well. And that, I mean, obviously that's a bad philosophy, but that's the mentality sometimes. I mean, that's what we've seen. Well, if, if you still stick with your foundation, meaning that, we call fouls on, we call, we blow our whistle on obvious plays. We shouldn't worry, like you won't miss, you won't have that luxury of going, well, we missed that when we're gonna miss this one. Like that eliminates that. This is an obvious foul. So that means that demands a whistle no matter what happens prior to. And if, if you go with that philosophy, uh, we missed that, then we are gonna miss this one. That's gonna be a domino effect and continue because when you going when are you going to stop at some point because say we missed this play here now we go down we're going to no call the next play because we missed the two plays then we're going to come back down and we're going to do the same thing again and no call that so that that no calling because we missed plays will never end so nipping in the bud right away yeah this is kenny i would martin i would disagree with that i i don't think referee and i think eric makes a good point our foundation says that's a big foul. And I don't think that we're gonna pass on that because we passed on another. I think they, I just don't think they saw that one. And even if I see the tail end and I see a play on the floor right now, if I'm the lead, I see a play on the floor, floor, I'm watching her reactions. How she gets up, if she's hurt, like I'm there because the ball is away, there's no other matchups. The, the sliding trail has the ball right now. No other matchups are engaged at all. So my attention is on the player on the floor because I want to know if she's hurt, um, if she's pissed off, and she's going to get up and, and retaliate. And that will help me, that will help me, um, you know, gauge what I'm going to do next. So, Kenny, I, I totally agree with you. I think, like I said, this is an extreme on this play, but you have to, I mean, I think you have to agree that. On other plays, we kind of just kind of go a blind eye because we know we missed something on one side. Now we pass on something on the other side. Yeah, this I'll agree. Is, I'll agree with that. This, this is egregious, and yeah. that's why I said this is an extreme part of it. Do you agree with that, Kenny? Yes, I do. I do. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. So what about player safety? Now, if that player is on the floor with a concussion, and we don't kill play, she's bleeding or maybe, you know, broken ankle, broken jaw, we don't attend to it, we just ignore that player on the floor. Now we do more harm to the, to the game itself. So somebody needs to watch that player. Um, even if White is pissed off and runs and steps on her, you know, in a, in a uh, you know, disrespectful, you know, deliberate act, and we don't see it because we're not watching that player on the floor, or the player in green can trip White as she runs by. So that play is not has not ended, and you should not like not be aware of the player on the floor. 
especially if she's pissed off. Eric, as uh, Mark rewinds it a little bit, uh, coming up the floor, please. Do you feel, I mean, you could disagree with me. I feel the trail has the best PCA, you know, primary coverage area on this play. I agree. So, so let's you. pause it for a second, though. If you're the lead and you're not refereeing where your partners cannot, then you're not refereeing. If you're on a vacation, so the lead right now is the anchor because all the players above free throw line extended. That means it's, it's, it's the responsibility to trail and slot. So now the lead should pick up where they can't or pick up any trouble areas. It's no different than when the trail, when all the play is below the free throw line extended between the slot and the lead, the trail is the anchor. The trail is supposed to back the slot and lead up because they have eight to 10 players to referee. So now the roles is reversed right now. So he can't go to sleep on the baseline because there's nothing in his area. And like you said, he might as well buy a ticket. I mean, this is the, this is the this is some of the plays that define your career. If right. the lead comes out in a cadence whistle and just blasts it, I mean, that could just catapult him into a lead status. Correct. Exactly. Okay. So, so really, the trail, trail, it is trail's responsibility, but the lead is is our is our our go-to guy when the play all the play is away from him because he has a bigger picture and he can pick and choose what he wants to referee. Exactly. When the, ball, when, when, the, when the ball is in front of the slot, the slot can't pick and choose. Slot has two matchups. Yep. So, so the, the, when you're not, you know, consumed by players, the referees that are, that's the furthest, they have a better chance of getting these plays because they have less responsibility. Okay, Mark. Eric, can you see the comments up here on the left? I got them. Um, okay. Uh, how would you sequence? How would you sequence your eyes and, and slot and the transition? Uh, we did go over that in. What happens is when you're in transition and slot, you should always referee the middle pack, but you always find the engaged matchups, and you always look for, for me, um, I, I will have to send these plays to you, but there's plays where I see guys running on the court with their fist balled up because we probably missed something on the rebound, and I and I stay with them and I get in there before something happens. So I'm always looking for things that can disrupt the game outside of normal basketball in a slot. Even in trail, running from trail to lead, when I'm looking back, I'm trying to find what can hurt me right now, and that's how I transition my eyes. Um, how do you adjust to a play when you realize that you see? Like I said, I, th I, th I think a big key is that the slot has to uh, be engaged in that red zone area. You yes. guys don't have the volleyball court, but it's clear right here, you know, especially in transition. All that cheap shot stuff, all that, all of this stuff. I mean, this is, like I said, this is an egregious play, but that's where the slot needs to keep his head in. See, to, to be, to be, to create a high level of focus, you must put in, um, I call them tools. So every position, there's a checklist I go through that ensures that I stay focused. So on a rebound, when the rebound happens, I find my partners. And that tells me where I need to go. And then that tells me my responsibility. So if I'm, out, I'm in slot, I tell myself to hold until the ball reaches free throw line extended, and then I tell myself to stay ahead of the ball and pick up the next wave. So every time I do something, there's a reason why I do it because I have a checklist that I've built up in every position that keeps me engaged into the game and not, it doesn't allow me to be relaxed at all. And you know what, Eric? That's a very good point. And Mark, this needs to go in your toolbox. I think high school officials need to develop a checklist. I don't think very many do. And especially in small college, in high school, develop a checklist from every position, like he said. I mean, that's a very good point. And you can't, you can't assume, even from the players to the table, to the coaches, you can't assume that the game is going to happen the way it's supposed to be. If it was going to happen the way it's supposed to be, then they wouldn't need us. 
So we are always there for the for for any time they get outside of that uh, out of bounds of how the game should happen to get them back in bounds. So same way when I call a foul or if my partner calls a foul, uh, just say just a common foul, non-shooting. I go clock. I make sure they put it up the penalty the, the penalty on the board. So we go from one to two like that because sometimes they forget they're talk they're talking or writing any something down so i back the table up that the foul should go up on the board so i know it's the second foul i know it's the third foul i know it's the fourth foul and i know when the penalty before the table knows so that's that's my checklist and literally like when when i inbound the ball we do it sometimes or some some of us do it you know with a smaller checklist they need to expand it because when you inbound the ball, the first thing you think about is starting the clock and you make sure the clock starts. But that's not it. Like you have to add to that checklist because it keeps going. So they start the clock and then you know what? We relax because we never gave ourselves a second checklist to be worried about. So and, I, and I think it's because we kind of get comfortable where the table and everybody else is kind of our, we should use them as a, a tool, not a crutch. It's yeah. the same thing with the monitor. You know, yeah. I know you guys have a, you know, blow and go and all this other stuff that's going on. You guys have different parameters, but I think a lot of like, even the NC2A, they use it more as a crutch more than a tool. You still got to rely on your instincts and your referee skill. Yep. I, I do not, I do not allow them to fail just like I hope they don't allow me to fail. So I don't, I don't want them hitting the horn and say we're in the penalty and I don't know it. Yep, exactly. So, but I'm I'm gonna beat them to it because I'm gonna let the crew know they win a penalty on the next foul. So we all on the same page and we move in sync like we know what we we're doing. Um, I use those other like the table as backup in case I don't know. So they back exactly. Up. I don't use that's it. Right. I don't depend on them at all. Yep. I don't depend tool, on them reset shot clock. I don't depend on them to let the subs in. I don't. You know, every possession. I'm, I'm looking for subs. When you hit the whistle, I'm looking for a sub. I'm not looking for them to hit the horn. I want to know before because I need to know that a sub is coming in. I don't want to be surprised. So my checklist is sub on, on a dead ball we can have a foul or when the ball goes out of bounds. My checklist is a clock subs. Hey, Eric. Yes. Eric. Hey, this is uh, Chris Coy. Hey, um, if you back it up, I know you said that Tell, tell me where you want us. Well, the old, the new trail thinks, the new trail thinks he's the, um, the new trail feels he's the new trail. Um, the old trail thinks he's the, the, the still the trail. Right? Chris, can you hear me? Did you leave? I think you left. Yeah, uh, someone said, MTH said, uh, self-talk is the checklist. That's what it is. I, I, I talk, when I'm, in, when I'm in a position, I call the player's numbers out in my head. I go, there's 10, there's 15, 12 and two are engaged. Make sure they're legal. Rotate, like I talk the whole entire time, literally, that when I leave my game, I'm mentally tired. Like when I get in the locker room, I think for like 10 minutes, I just sit there and I don't, you can ask my partners, I don't say much. I have to like come down because my brain has been going the whole time. And the reason I do that because we only could think of one thing at a time. I mean, that, that is proven. You can't think of two things at a time. You can't listen to me and talk at the same time. It's just not possible. So I need that checklist and I go down that checklist and I come back to it and I go back through it again. And I keep doing it. And then when I change positions, my new checklist is there. So you have to do that. And if you're not mentally tired after a game, you haven't created a high level of focus for yourself. <laughs> I mean, Eric, I mean, that, those, are, very, those, those are absolutely very good points. I mean, you, okay, have, to use self, you have to use self-talk throughout the entire game. No you doubt. have to know who, who the uh, impact players are. You have to know who's hot, who's not, yeah. who's your disruptors, all that yeah. stuff. I mean, you just have to know everything that's going on. If you want to be that high level official, 
you, I mean, that's a, that's an awesome point, a self-talk situation throughout that, the entire game. But that's how we make, make the game look like it's it run, su supposed to run. Yep. And people don't know that we do those things that make it run that way. Even, even when we know the game gets rough and we start blowing more whistles, we just told ourselves to bring the game back. The fans don't know it, especially when we get it early. When we nip it in the bud early, the fans don't see us getting them back to playing basketball. And when they play, they go, ah, that was a great game. But they don't know we was integral in, in that, making it a great game, you know? But they will recognize that we let it get out of hand. I also hope you agree with this point. And if you, I mean, it, it's fine. There's a sixth sense that you have as an official that the game is getting out of hand. And as, in actuality, and at, they can't teach you that at any camp. You right. just have to have that in you. Is that is that a fair statement? Yes. The, um, you do it. If, but if, if you develop a checklist, and the, the, first thing, the first thing I do when I referee a play, the first thing I determine if that player is legal or those players are legal. And usually in a rough game, they're not legal. So that tells me right then I need to, I need to you know, put my focus or attention there and nip it in the butt right away because I know those actions can domino effect and create everybody to be you know, rough and physical. So if you can determine right away if something's not legal and address it, it's better for your game than like we let these two plays go, we didn't address them, and now what's going to happen is White player, their teammates gonna take up for her, and green player teammates gonna take up for her. So they're all gonna get physical now. It's gonna oh, domino effect. Hey Eric, this is uh Damon, this is Damon uh, Patterson. Got a quick yeah. question. Yes. How do you um how do you adjust to a play when you can tell that you're beat? As you can see, like um if you rewind it all the way back to the beginning, uh huh. Um, you see the official that's closest to the bait to the uh to the sideline in the C spot right now. No, the other one down right there. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Now we we know that he he realizes that okay he's out of position. So as you as you said earlier, he looks and doesn't look back to see what's what's occurring in the play. But he can tell that he's beat at the same time. How do you adjust to that as an official? Well, let's talk about being beat when there's a transition and you're the referee and you have to referee that play. Okay. If, if I'm going down and there's a fast break and I'm going from uh, trail to lead, and the player's ahead of me, I find a comfortable spot, and I referee from that spot. Because we don't do well on the mute move as referees. And also, if we're moving, the players are moving at the same, same, like, same speed, we're always going to stay stacked. Okay. So if I stop, that player's going to move past me, and I'm going to have an open look at that play. So I referee that play until it dissolves, and then I get to my original position. So basically you just wanted to let it develop a little bit? Yeah, I, I find a comfortable spot to sit in and then I referee that play. Like I will stop, if I'm going to trail the lead, usually I will stop below free throw line extended between the baseline and the free throw line, somewhere in there. Okay. I will stop and referee the play to the basket. And then okay. I will get to the baseline after that play has dissolved. All right, cool. Thank you. So, because we're at, on the move, we always, our eyes are going like this on the move. That's why you see an umpire, he get over the back and he, he get down and he stop. That's, that's clear vision there. His okay. eyes aren't jumping. And he can, he can, he can uh, focus on everything he needs to focus on and get the play right. So we use that it's, same concept. It's a lot more difficult to make a call on the run than it is in a front court status because your eyes are always moving, like yep. Eric said. And, you know, it, it's tough, you know, bottom line. Good question, Dana. I want to add to that. This is Bryce. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Bryce. Yep. Uh, like you said, uh, Eric, um, if you are if there if you are being beat and you're going to be the new lead, there's no use of trying to bust in your butt to get down to the end line because you're going to miss the play. You have to stop. You know why you you're going to miss the play? Yeah, because your mind is thinking about getting to the baseline. It's not thinking about the play. That's correct. So we're not, we're not, we can't think think of two things at at one time. So you have to stop and get your mind focused on what needs your attention. 
absolutely correct. Rick, I just wanted to try to uh, give that a uh, little bit, bit of information to add to what you said to, to Damon's question, because a lot of times people try to run, run to try to make it. Well, yeah. if you already beat, you're too late. You yeah. just get a comfortable spot and referee it, re referee to get a clear look to make the call on the play, even if you're not at the end line. So what? I mean, if, if, I if he stops and referees that play, he will have all the information he needs to make a, out, any kind of decision, out of bounds, foul, no call. Absolutely. Yep, yep. Thank you. We're going to the next play, Eric. Yep. Any more questions before we leave? Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Chris came back. His internet dropped. Chris, you still want to ask your question? Is he here, Chris? I think he's got boost. Okay. <laughs> oh. I'm good, Eric. All right, cool. Oh, that's messed up. Let's roll. Hey, I have a question. <laughs> this, is, this is Josh. I have one question. Oh, hey, Josh, go ahead. I just want to clarify. So, so you're saying if you're beat on a play, you shouldn't try to race all the way to the end line to get the play. You should just get in a comfortable spot to where you can see a play? Yep. Okay. You, you will make a better decision. I, because again, I do that. I do that sometimes. Like, if I, you watch I, my hands, if, if, if I'm running even with the players, if I stay like that, I'm going to stay stacked the whole way through. So you can't see anything. If I stop and they move, that opens up for me. So technically, I'll be a slot right now on the drive to the basket. Okay. Right. You want the play to open up to you. You don't want to stay stacked. Yeah, I got you. Next play. All right, I'll run it twice live and then uh, tech. Chat me if it's lagging, I'll go through slow mo. Lagging, yeah, lagging a little yeah, bit. That one, that one lag. But it's the one with the bad internet, Eric. So I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're fine. <laughs> okay. Whatever, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Let me know when to start stuff, Eric. Okay. Let's just run the whole play so we can see the sequence, and then we can talk about them. So right there, we have a no call. Yep. That's it right there. That's the end of it. And then on a similar play on the other end, we have a call. So let's talk about sequencing plays. Let's first talk about why we missed this play. So pause it right there. No, go back. Go back right before the contact. Maybe like one or two dribbles outside. Back a little bit more. Right there, right there. Pause it. Now, if you look at Lee's head, look at his head. He's, he's actually like looking at the ball. So what should happen here, Lee should be expecting once, once she beats that first defender, what's going to happen? Pause right there. What's going to happen? Help. So he should not be looking at the dribbler. He should be looking at help. And if, you, if you're able to pick up that second defender, Put them in view. That helps you determine. When I see her, I'm going to ask myself, is she legal? And by the time that offensive player gets there, let it play. You can see right now she's beat. She's still beat. She's still beat. See, his eyes stay on her the whole time, stay on the shooter the whole time. And by the time he gets to the defender, when the offensive player meets the defender, he feels that the defender is legal. And that's why we make that play. So now, you have to transition your eyes. Pause it, Mark. This is how I referee. This is how I teach myself to pick up the next defender. 
I work me 70 30. 30 percent of my vision is on the offensive player because I want to try to pick up travels or carries or anything like that. But the other 70 percent is on the defenders. So I always try that, that makes me aware of the next defender. If I have the offensive player and I find I have, I have 100% on the offensive player, I tell myself 70-30 and, and find a, put my 70% of my vision on the, uh, the defender. So I use 70-30 all the time. Um, I, I don't know if many of you know Al Batista, but he talks about it a whole lot. So if he had picked up that defender, he, would, he, would, he probably would have called a block. Now, we go to the other end. And pause it. Go back. This is, this is a play where the lead is beat. Lead did not hustle to the baseline. And look at his position. And this is what I'm talking about right now. He's running with the players. So can he tell if that, that number 10 is legal or not? He cannot tell. He stacked, but the trail has a good look at it there and sees the illegal movement where he didn't pick up the illegal movement of the defender prior to and correctly calls a foul. But the problem now that we know called the first play and then we call this play that are similar plays with actually the offensive player here doesn't fall, but previously the offensive player fell on the other end. So now our credibility is shot. And we call this, since, I mean, and we're going to add this, the team in white is the home team. Now, like, you know, team in red going to say, we're not, that's the voodoo stuff they start talking about. We don't get calls on the road. We don't do this. We don't do it intentionally, but we need to recognize that. So it, it you know, you have to understand, I don't want you to miss this play, but you have to know, like, to prevent the first play prevent missing the first play, mechanically you have to be sound on how you process plays and how you pick up the defender. Any questions? I see some coming in. No, no, no questions. I, I, I mean, I totally agree with, with that concept, especially in, in this, in this, this two-man mechanics. Uh, something that you all alerted to earlier it's, and I believe this thoroughly, that similar styles of whistles uh, or plays deserves either similar styles of whistles or no whistles, so that our credibility is not shot. Uh, because this definitely was a foul on the other end, and we come down on this end, and we're out of position, and we call the foul. So uh, it's grabbing and having a feel for what we are calling and what we're not call, calling, but yet and still calling obvious plays. So, so you, you know, it's two man mechanics is, yeah. It's, let's, it's, go, let's, go back to, let's go back to the very first play, Mark. Again, very first play. Right now, Lee, Lee has primary, go back out. So say Lee is on ball like he is, he's wide enough. He's wide enough. The problem is his shoulders are turned more toward the, to that way, which gives him tunnel vision. If he turns his shoulder, his, his peripheral opens up. Now, the trail should be closed down, maybe on the floor, 28 foot line, somewhere in there. He should be picking up all help defenders because he has no other responsibilities and there's no, really no other engaged matchups. So what happens is if the, if the lead misses this play, Trail can back him up and be his anchor and have a whistle on that play. So just because Trail is over there doesn't, doesn't relieve him of any responsibilities. So pause it. Right now, Trail is on a one-on-one -on -one matchup, right? On ball. So that leads, I mean, lead is. So Trail lead should is. have the, the post players right there next to the ball. That's correct. Right? Right there. Yes. If, if these players on his side are not engaged, he needs to go somewhere where they are engaged and right there. Because there's no way lead is going to referee both matchups. Hey, hey uh, Eric. Yes. Um, so what if you run into a situation where um, you and your partners discuss like, okay, these are two physical teams, like we're going to let them play a little bit. 
and going out on the court, that's your mindset, letting them play. And then you see something like that. Well, was that a – can you guys still hear me? But, okay, so letting them play – letting them play has to deal with plays where both teams can be – both players can be deemed legal and it doesn't affect the play. It doesn't – you don't let them play through illegal contact. You let them play through, like, um, just say a player 60-40. Can it be a foul? Just say a defender, say, say vertically, he jumps and he, he slightly moves forward and the offensive player moves into him and the offensive player makes a layup. Could that be a foul? Yes, yeah, 60-40. So we let him play through that because it didn't affect speed, balance, quickness, or anything like that, and he was able to play through that contact. But I'm not going to allow a defender to jump from A to B into – clearly a foul into a offensive player and say, I'm, not, I'm going to no call that. Because what that do is causes inconsistency, not just from that game, but from refereeing period across from the minor leagues all the way up to the NBA. We have to call the same foul across the board. So if it's illegal contact, that's a standard across the board that every referee lives by, and we must uphold those standards. So don't ever allow your standards to be compromised because of a philosophy. A philosophy must fit inside the standard. Understand? The philosophy serves the standard. The standard doesn't serve philosophy. Eric, uh, Donovan Peters talking here. Um, I think this kind of goes back a little bit to Martin's point that he was talking about in the beginning, where in high school basketball, you see officials who miss plays, for instance, on this end, they miss the play. So at the other end of the floor with very similar contact, they've decided, well, we didn't give them that call at the other end of the floor, so they're going to no call it. And I think that's some of the trap falls that we fall into, especially in high school basketball. You see a lot of that, at least in the Southern California area. Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, I know he missed that call. Does that mean he should not pass on the one down at the other end of the floor? No, he should not pass on it. Can I make a comment first? This yes. is Kenny. Yep. Can we say less experienced officials rather than high school officials? Because I think that's that's a uh, that's a fair. That's not, a, that's it's not a, a fair that's comment. Fair. That's fair, Kenny. That's fair. That's fair. That's very fair. Uh, to change that verb is to less lesser officials. Um, Eric, less 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 experienced officials. Hello. Can, can, can anybody hear? Something? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Bradley Ward. Um, Eric, I, first of all, this is a two-man crew, correct? Yes. Okay. And you made a comment, Eric, that if this lead, well, which didn't make the call, that the trail could come in and make that blocking call, um, I would just say that there would be a number of officials in our San Antonio chapter that would be not very happy if I was the lead and I made a call. Uh, if I was a trail and I came in and made a call with the lead standing where he is on a blocking call on that side of the court. Okay. Have, have you ever played basketball? Oh, yeah. So when you were beat and you had a shot blocker at the basket and he didn't come over and help and block the shot, were you pissed that he didn't help? No. Or, or you, were you happy that he did help? Well, I'm, I'm not speaking about myself. I'm just saying I – but that, my point is, we are a team, we're not individuals on the floor. And here, well, the, 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 league, the league gets tunnel vision, and he, he never picks up the secondary defender, and we miss a play. Now, to this, why, would, why would I be mad at my partner for helping out on a play that we need to get well, versus him, him not helping me out, and I missed the play, and now I have to tee the coach up or a player? Or if you look at the score right now, we miss a play for the team that's down 14 points. And then we go call a foul for the team that's up 14 points. Are we burying the red team? I, I, I'm not, Eric, I'm not disagreeing with you. I actually, I probably would be somebody that might come in and make that call. But the problem is, is that the, uh, the argument might be is that your, your partner is, uh, you're, you're hanging your partner out to dry when he's standing five feet away from the play and you're uh, 25 feet away from the play. Yeah, see, well, 
I've never been taught that. Um, and that the, my points I was giving to you are, are, are not for you, for you to take back to, the, to that person or that group to let them know like we're a team and it should be taught as such because angles change, our focus. So I'll give you an example. I'm on the floor. We got new referees, first year referees, and the house is coming down on that first year referee. Okay. And what happens is they they close up. Like their primary was this big. And now that they everybody's coming at them, it's like this. And they're right. afraid to blow the whistle because they've been coming at them every play. Am I not going as a crew chief go and keep the game in order or allow it to be disrupted because he's not blowing his whistle? Gotcha. Like I'm going to keep the game in order, but I'm gonna to try to get him out the tank. So this is no different. This referee right now at this on this particular play is in the tank because he don't pick up that play. So we have to stress two groups that have that mentality that we are a team. And I back. I didn't. He didn't call a foul on the primary defender. He called a foul on the secondary defender where the, the lead did not pick up. And that's all that was. It, it wasn't. I'm. I'm helping you. I'm not. It's not like I'm coming in front of you, Bradley, calling a hand check. Gotcha. A person came over to help. And gotcha. if, just say that defender, even if the defender came from slot side, I mean, uh, trail side, Lee would not be able to pick that play up because he has <laughs> tunnel vision that he, he's not going to pick up any new help defenders at all. Good. So he needs help. So okay. it, I, I just, it's hard for me to believe that there's groups out there that don't want help on a play, or they misconstruing from being called on primary versus help defenders. You always you, you need help on help defenders most of the time. Good, thank you. I think in a, in a two person game, it is just so difficult in today's game, regardless women's, men's, whatever it is, it's just difficult to pick those up. But if you allow the lead, to have a chance to call and he doesn't, and you come in and get it on an obvious play, you know, it, it's a good call, you know. And after you look at it on video, which obviously almost every game, regardless of what level you're working, is online, you're you're going to have to say thank you, yeah. regardless, you know. And and if you're dealing with a three-person game, it's it's a lot easier. You just got to know what your PCA is, your primary coverage area. And then if you come in with a cadence whistle, and I'm sure Eric will agree, I mean, how many times have you said or I said or, you know, at, at the upper levels, hey, thanks for getting that call, because sometimes you just get blocked off at the last second. Yep. You get stacked in the last second and someone gets it and you're good to go. And, and, and the main point that I'm trying to make is that, he, like he said, you got five players with a common goal, either to protect the basket or score a basket. You have three players that are just trying to get plays right. Right. And if you don't pass the ball, and you know, at the uh, player level, or do make the right cut, or whatever the case may be, the play gets screwed up. If you're not in the right coverage area, and so on and so forth, our plays get screwed up. Is that fair, Eric? Yes. We should, we should stress more teamwork now than, um, especially like you say, referees are getting exposed from NBA level to all the way down to even AAU games are being filmed and they're being put on YouTube. And people are going, parents and coaches are going like, look at this play, you know, we, we got cheated, we got this and that. That should make us more aware that we need to be more of a team than the individual referee. I don't get paid by the calls that I make, I don't get deducted from, the calls I miss, maybe sometimes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we all get plays like together as a group, nobody's talking about a play that a referee missed. They say the game was called fairly and they got a fair chance. They walk off the court, they all wave, and we go about our business. Eric, can I add to that or I have a question for you? Yep. <laughs> To Brad's point, this is a big issue, especially in our chapter, and I'm sure it's all over the country. Is, do you mind touching on when is a good time to extend out of your primary? And that may answer a lot of questions people may, may have on even this play, another place. Similar yeah, to. I mean, like we, we, 
we have we have standards and the standards are obvious cause um and that is an obvious call that affects that player's balance. It causes them to miss a shot. Uh, and it just, it's, just a, it's just a foul that anybody would call any time of the game. That's not a play that we would pass on. Um, she's late to the spot, and she trips up the shooter. So those type of plays, especially, on, especially with secondary defenders, help should be on the way. Primary defenders, if, if, if that – lead if that was one-on-one -on -one matchup and that lead lead chose to pass on it then that probably wouldn't come in because they're looking at the play um being a crew chief in the nba i do come out of my primary sometimes on plays that i that i feel will help the game and if i'm the crew chief on that game right there i will come out my primary and get that play but i also hope that my partners would do the same thing for me it's just not a one-way street for me so if I'm in the league and I miss that play, I'm hoping Mark or Martin come get that play. And then I'm gonna say thank you guys because I did not focus on the secondary defender. I appreciate it. So obvious plays, we should all have a whistle on obvious plays. And that's just that's just a standard across the board that you go to any camp at any level that we all live in and die by. It can't be a marginal play because you think it's a hand check or you think it was a little bit of contact. You don't come out of the primary on those plays. Obvious plays. And you have to understand what obvious versus marginal or incidental. I'm not sure your terminology. Yeah, in incidental is good, yeah. Um, okay. I hope that answered the question. But remember, standard. Standard is what every referee referees by. It's no different if a, if, a, if a player point his finger at you and say, you fucking suck. We all know that's technical foul. How many of us would not call that as a technical foul? That's a standard, no matter where you go, right? Absolutely. So if, if we, don't, we don't allow those standards to be compromised at any point in the game. Um, before we move on to the next play, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, I think we have Honk on this call in Canada and Mexico uh -huh. and um, from members of DDR. And also, I know Mark did a great job of getting, uh, I think, about five coaches, Mark, yep. uh, that are on here. And I think that's a great uh, movement because they need to understand what we see and we also need to understand what they see and what they teach and so on and so forth. So we can come to a common agreement on, on uh, these types of plays. So Mark, great job on the coaches and you know, welcome to the other countries that are on this call. Thanks for having can, me guys. Can I make a comment? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? I hear you MTH. All right. Hey, one, two comments, great. Yeah, it's a great uh, session. What you were Thanks. speaking about, Eric? Uh, I think we call those like high expectancy plays where the players expect fouls, the, the fans expect fouls, and we don't have a whistle, then that's where we have issues. Uh, the second point that you made, which is great, I'm down here in San Antonio and I understand uh, Bradley Ward's uh, uh, or, or issue he has or questions he has. Yep. Uh, but I'd rather be one for two than 0 for two, and that's how the game gets out of hand. Correct. If you, if, if a play is passed on at one end or, or missed or whatever you want to call it, and then you go down the other end and you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to let this go because we let that go at the other end, then the crew has actually went 0 for 2, and the credibility is going down, 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 down. So you'd rather have the whistle on the plate and try to be, bring the game back on the, on the proper road that you want it on. So uh, that philosophy of trying to match plays is very dangerous or can be dangerous. Thank you. Far as far as no calls, far as no calls. Matching play as far as calls is a little different because if I call a foul, if I call that foul and that play, that second play that happens is a similar foul, they are like, that's a fair match. That's a fair match, but missing standard or legal acts and go down and miss another one, that's not how we should referee. Um, totally agree. And totally agree. I'm, I'm gonna give you a Joey Crawford-ism 
and he always says this, and he said it. He's I've been in the league 16 years. Uh, he he was in the league for 40 some years. He always put the game first. He put the crew second, and then himself last. Meaning that it's not about you as a referee. It's about the game first, and then it's about the, the crew working as a unit second. If I put me first, that throws all that out of whack. Because I'm we're gonna be refereeing different games. Because I'm gonna referee my game, and then you two guys gonna be refereeing however you referee, and I'm gonna screw the whole system up. So we gotta stop thinking it's about me and, and go team, just like coaches preach. If I had one guy that's trying to shoot all the baskets and nobody else is shooting, we're gonna lose the game. It's a team effort. Right? True that. All right. Next play. Like, Unless right. somebody has one last question. Does the coaches want to do the coaches want to speak at all? Ask a question at all? No, they want to talk during the season. They don't want to talk now. <laughs> uh, and and Mark, that's a good point. But you know, this is a very great op opportunity right now for them to talk and ask questions, especially from a high level official like that. Nothing. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll wait till uh, December two thousand twenty. <laughs> After the virus is over. <laughs> After the very first call. Exactly. <laughs> okay, let's move on. All right, next play. Here we go. Hold on. Fred Hunter, if you can hear me, I know Fred's on here. So somehow you're controlling my screen, so I need you to take that off. <laughs> I'm trying to get you, I even try to get you out of here, but Fred, go ahead and change the settings because you're controlling my screen, my man. All right, let's try this again. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, Eric talked about this play, and I, I think this is a very good play uh, that has multiple actions in this play. Yes, there's uh, three, di three different decisions being made here. Yep, exactly. Go ahead, Eric. So let's talk about the very first play. If you look at our positioning, we are in position A in every position. We have a trail with an open look. Uh, he's right there. He can see the screen by number 12. He's looking at the defenders. Uh, we have the slot open look right now. Uh, and we have the lead wide ready to accept any play coming his way. So we're in position A right now. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, lead need to be aware of the matchup on his right. Uh, slot, just stay, keep, it, keep open any curl play coming his way, especially coming off that screen coming down the middle, which what happens when he passes the ball. Yep. So let it play. I'm just going to do a slow mo because it's like right, pass, like pause it right now. Right now, as oh, ooh. come on, Fred. Fred's not listening to me. Okay, do it again. Pause it right now. The lead should be picking up the defender. The trail should have stayed sideline oriented right there on the 28 foot line. Open look, slot needs to adjust quicker because what happens, four walks right in front of him. And the longer he, he takes, it takes him one second to get open where it should have taken him three tenths. He should have felt that 14 was getting ready to walk in front of him and move immediately um, because we have action. Because pause, if, he, if, he, if that guy passes to 14 right there, he's stacked on the shot, and plus he can't see the defender closing out. So you want to eliminate those by, by moving quick as possible to get a, maintain that open look. You, you don't want a one second, you want three tenths at the most, okay? So now look at Lee. Lee is closed down looking, he's looking at the play, I guess, trying to see his head. I would have been a little bit more open toward the play. 
Now, right now, the league has to determine if that defender is legal or not. And if that defender is illegal, he's responsible for all the contact on this play. And if that play, that contact disrupts that offensive player, we must have a foul. We cannot no call this. Now, all three referees have a really good look at that play. And in the middle of the paint, it's really a dual coverage area between lead and slot. So even if lead does not blow, the play is curling to the slot, which slot has curl plays to his side. So actually, it's a dual coverage area. But you give slot, you give lead first crack at it. And if lead doesn't blow, then slot should have a cadence whistle on that play. So this is an obvious foul here, a standard play that we should have a whistle on. So we no call, he passes it out. The second play is a drive. Pause it, go back. So let's, let's pick up when he like dribbles right to like to TLC. He had, the offensive player has the ball at the TLC. So right there. So we see right now the action of the offensive player is going to drive. Now we must pick up the next defender. So Trail has, Trail has the inside guy, that first guy right there reaching in. Slot will have the guy on this side reaching in. Right there. And then Lee has the front side and also that, that secondary defender waiting on him. Yep. So we got to play covered. Now, once he beats those, beats those two players, the slot should transition his eyes to this player right here at the, at, in the arc, the RA, the big fella, waiting on him, right there. That's where Lee's head should be. And we determine if he's legal or not. So we let it play. He jumps vertical, pause it, he's jumping vertical. So now we determine he's legal. Our next focus should be the offensive player. And if the offensive player creates any illegal contact, he's responsible for that. And now we have to determine if that's an offensive foul. And if both players are legal, then we have a no call, which I deem that play is a no call because both players are legal. The offensive player did not dislodge and the defender was there and jumped vertically or, or held his ground basically. He went up vertically. So he did not dislodge the defender. That's a great no call in my opinion. And all three referees have a good look at it. Now on this pass, the problem with this, this play here is both referees trail and lead, they go with the ball instead of staying with the play. If the lead should stay with the play until it dissolves and the trail should go with the ball on the pass. Because say that often the player had this lost the defender and ran him over, since both of them left the play, we would have had a no call. So really the furthest official away should go with the ball and the, the referee that was refereeing the, the primary defender should stay with the play until that dissolves. So go back, go back to right when he jumps into his chest. See, the lead should stay, the lead should stay with that play right there on that collision, stay with it the entire time until it dissolves instead of taking his head off the play. And then he should go to the ball. Trail did this, the right thing by going with the ball, picking up the shooter. Yep. So that was a clean play. Anybody disagree that this is a, a great no call? Do you think that's a foul? I think it's a great no call. Good enough. Okay. Now, uh, Eric, go ahead. Eric, I was, I was listening to Mark Wunderlich the other night on um, one of the podcasts, and he talked about going from defender to defender. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like in this play, I, I think it like really speaks to this, this play. And yeah, this is a perfect play. Uh, and what he's talk, usually talking about is when you at lead, and just say right here, we're going to talk about it right now. This is, this is, this is what Mark Wunderlich is talking about. Let the play roll. Let the play roll a little bit. Pause it, go, go back, which he doesn't do here. So now go back. Once this offensive player beats this primary defender, the first thing that Lee should do is go straight to the next defender instead of stay with the offensive player. 
see his head staying with the offensive player? His eyes, he never picks up his secondary defender. So his, you want to go from defender to defender. You don't want to go from defender to the offensive player to the defender. Okay. So, so go back to when the guy contests a three-point shot. Right here. So we take this guy passes by him. As soon as he passed by him, your eye should go to the next defender. Pause it. Now his right there. It should go right there. Should pick up that guy. Instead, he goes from defender to the offensive player, which which causes us to pick up the defender late. The earlier you can pick up the defender, the better your decisions are. See, right there, that defender is, is in a legal position. The offensive player goes right into his chest, knocks him back, spins through him, and to the basket. So to me, that would have been an offensive foul, unless you disagree. It, it's a close play where you probably could have a block, but it, like the defender was there. I don't know what else you want him to do. I wouldn't split hairs on it. See, see, see the, the reason, even though you look like he's leaning, pause it right now. That offensive player's body is in the midsection or torso of the defender. He's straddling like right there. See his feet are between the defender's feet. Offensive foul. So we can't miss that first play. And then because we say we missed that first play, we come back and miss this play here. Those are two obvious fouls we should have had whistles on that we don't have. And his eyes, the lead eyes is clearly on the offensive player the entire time. And that's why we missed the play. Any questions? You understand the concept of going from defender to defender. Even if this guy beats that defender there and the bigs are in the paint, he should go from that defender straight to the bigs in the paint. He should go from him to them, him to help defenders. Yep. Eric. Yes. This is Bradley Ward again. On the very hey, first play, the very first play off the pick and roll, was that foul a blocking foul? That correct. Was a blocking foul, correct? Yeah, because because is a reason it's a blocking foul. You can go back to it, Mark, because he never beat the uh, offensive player or never got into it in front of him. His path. Pause it. See the offensive player's path is across the lane. Yes. It's going from sideline to sideline. Uh -huh. That defender is not in his path. He never right. legally established in the path of the offensive player, so he's late to the spot. Yep. And he's and he's, and he's responsible for that contact right there. Okay. Good. Uh, that's the responsibility of the lead in the C spot. Am I correct? Yes, because the play curl to the play curl to C, but also the prompt that help defender came from lead side, so they both have responsibility on the play. But I would give lead first crack at it. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. And if we Slot use the philosophy, if you, if we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Slot has all curl plays, correct? Yep. Slot Our, has, and does this play curl to slot? Yep, yep. Yep, so it's his part, he's, he's partly responsible for it too. Hey, um, Eric, I was listening to a podcast um, huh? maybe like a few days ago. I think it was Mark Wunderlich as well. He said, um, um, one thing that he he does as an official or that he did was he would always focus on the actual play itself and what is occurring rather than the ugliness of it. Can you elaborate on it a little bit? Yeah, um, we have plays, and and these usually happen on block shots, where the defender gets to the ball, and the offensive player flips over and falls on his back or hit his head, and that that play looks ugly, correct? Yeah. But the defender was legal. So how our process of play is, when when I first when I first look at a defender, I determine if he's legal. If he's legal, then the the offensive player is responsible for all the other contact that happens on that play, and I'm gonna no call it. So I'm calling a play based on the actions of the defender, and then the actions of the offensive player, not based on how it looks. Like I when you know they talk about the NBA don't call travels. We don't call travels if it looks funny. We call travels based on we know that 
he moved his pivot foot or he took three steps, you know, or something like that, or a carry, not because it looked funny, because we know his hand was under the ball. Oh. Same thing with fouls. We call it based on the illegal act versus legal act. Okay. Does that explain it? Yeah, it does. I was just confused on it when he was talking about it, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of players that look ugly, um, especially when both players jump and they kind of meet. They both go kind of A to B, but it's not, a, a, you know, it's like a slight A to B and they meet. Or sometimes ugliness is, if I go up in my shooting motion straight up like this, I don't extend out, I go up, and the defender close out into my arm, that's on the defender. That's not on me shooting the ball. So it may look ugly. You know what I mean? I don't, we don't get caught up in the ugly. We get caught up in the legal versus illegal versus legal. Eric, that Eric would eliminate Donovan. ugly at all. That would eliminate ugly, period. Eric Donovan Peters. Um, I have one question. Are you okay yes. with the trail coming in even since the lead and the slot didn't come? And he Definitely. gave them a chance and the trail coming in with I a do. cadence. But I am sensitive. I am sensitive to how like other levels teach teach that play. For us, the trail can come in and get that play easily because he, he has a really good look, open look at the uh, lateral movement of the defender. Okay, thank you. Yes. I mean, that's an obvious foul. That's a standard foul that we need to have. And the reason he passed, so think about this. That offensive player is trying to score. He has a defender beat. But that contact causes him to pass the ball because he gets off balance. So that, that affected his rhythm, his rhythm, speed, balance, and quickness, and the ability to score. So that's an obvious foul. It affected all four, or really five. Can, can we agree on, uh, you know, we talk about referee, the closest defender to you. I mean, if he has him, yep. if he has him, if he has even this guy, we got the play covered. Yeah. Now, I mean, to be honest, I am not a big referee, the closest guy. Okay. Um, I'm more of, because the thing about it is, on shots, I referee point of contact. I don't referee defenders on, on shots. You, you know what I mean? So if a guy go off to shoot, I look at his arms. I'm not looking at a defender. If I look at a defender, they would trick me with the slider hands. Yep. Because they would put their hands up. So when the defender does this, we go, he put his hands up. But we have slick defenders that do that and hit the elbow of the shooter as they go up. Yes. So if I'm looking at the elbows and I see this, and, he, and the defender cannot tell me his hands are straight up. His hands went right into the elbow of the shooter. So what I relate this to is uh, like, Cops and bank robbers. Like, the cops don't go watch the bank robbers at home. They watch the bank because the, the robbers have to get to the bank or the, or the jury or whatever. They watch the place where all of the money or gold is hidden. Where, to me, the basketball is the gold or the, or, or the big diamond. And the defender is trying to steal that diamond. So if I'm watching the diamond, I can tell if that defender hits the ball or I can tell that defender hits the arm, or if it's not even touched at all. So I always go to point of contact <clears throat> on shots. But on plays like this where he's not taking a shot, I do referee the defender because I want to see if he's legal or not. And here we can tell he's legal. And uh, so sometimes refereeing the closest guy, like when they split at, a, at the free throw line extended, the closest guy will referee that type of play there. So go back, could you go back to when he uh, go, well, actually it's forward, right? It's yeah. forward when the, when, when the guy gets the ball and he splits him. It's the second play. Go back from there. Go back from that play. Yeah. Right there. So right there, those are the type of plays I referee the closest guy because the angles change and I only have, really have one look. Only, like the slot only has one look at the closest guy. The trail has one look at the closest guy. But the lead actually is wide enough to see both and which is he can see the point of contact if he's looking at the offensive player's arm. He can tell if the right defender or the left defender grabs the arm. So there are certain times when I referee the closest guy, and there are certain times I referee point of contact. 
So, so does it make sense? You got me, Martin? Make sense? Um, Give me a second. Are you, are you am I on? I yeah, you. no, it absolutely makes sense. It goes back to your checklist. Yes, it's my checklist. Exactly. Yes. So once you know a play has progressed to a certain point, now you're going to go to point of contact. Right. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Mark. Next play. <laughs> yep. I hear you, Ian. <laughs> this is a very, uh, is this the, uh, is this very the last play, Mark? Out of bounds yeah. play. Very interesting play. Yeah, this is, this is a very good play. Yep. So pause it for a second. To be clear on the last play, the last sequence, first foul should have been a block. The second foul is a no call. And the third foul is a, it should have been an offensive foul. So we have three decisions on that, on that one play, which are great examples of, to, to train yourself how to uh, transition your eyes from the defender to defender and determine if the defender is illegal versus illegal. Um, so that's just one play can, you can learn a lot from in every position and create open looks, which they, they did create open looks on that play. Okay, we go. here we go. Let's see if it goes out of bounds. So let it play. Tap, tap. So pause it right there. The trail official knows that White knocked the ball out of bounds. <clears throat> he never have to look and see if the ball actually hit out of bounds on the line. He knows who, who it, it is out on. What he should be looking for, who is going after the basketball and make sure they both are legal. So now let's, let's watch. His eyes are watching what? It's hard to tell from this angle. Look like it's on the player. And he no calls it. It did not, the play did not eat him up. I just think he made a decision to allow that to happen. This is definitely a foul on blue for stepping in the path of a moving opponent and does not allow him time and distance. That would be a blocking foul if that guy had the ball. So he steps in the path right here. We'll pause it. Look at, look at, look at the, if you go back one or two clicks, if you watch this angle right here, his, the, the trail official eye is watching the ball hit the ground. Like watch, it, watch his head go, it's starting to go down, down. And he's watching the ball, he's waiting for the ball to go out of bounds. So he totally missed the play. Where the lead, the lead can be our anchor on this play and come get this play. So I'm not sure who's on, who's on offense or defense. I don't remember how the start, play started. But uh, time and distance, so blue shot the ball. So that would be a foul on the offensive team here. His whole job was to disrupt the white guy from get, white team player from getting the ball. And, and on those type of plays, you should pick up those players that's going after the basketball, not the ball itself. And if, if that happens, that is such an obvious foul that any referee on that floor can call that play. You can come from lead or slot to get that play. Even though that's all the way to the other side, that's egregious. Like, if we miss that play and then go call a hand check, that doesn't add up. We and have that's to have this foul. And this is a very good point at the uh, lower levels, as Kenny wanted me to uh, address. Um, Pause it right there. The, the definition of a crew saver. Yep. So the lead, which is the closest person probably, could have came out and got this. Yep. And Slot had a very open look at it as well. Yep. That's, uh, uh, but agree to disagree. I mean, that's a very big sell from the slot, right? And if I was a crew chief on that game, I would not allow my crew to fail and lose credibility on this type of play. I'm not going to say, well, that was his call or that was her call. That's a crew call right here. That's not marginal contact. No, like, that's not at all. Borderline. Like, if I wanted, if, I, if there was mess in that game, I will call a flagrant on that, flagrant one, because that's just unnecessary. 
But if nothing else has happened, I would just probably go with a common file. That's clearly unnecessary. And I would say at the lower levels, uh, a common foul would be acceptable, a hard sell because of the powers to be, but it would be a acceptable call after review or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know. Because what can lead from this, if you see the player on the ground hurt, and and you know that they can retaliate from that kind of action. That's like that's not really a normal foul. That doesn't fall in a normal mm -hmm. foul category, but you can deem that normal. But if we've had a rough game, I'm gonna nip it in the bud with a with a flagrant foul on that. That's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with it, but I'm I'm gonna bring everybody down off of that play. It, it all goes back to your point at the first, the very first play. If the player, uh, we had a no call on the first bump, and then the and then we go down the floor and we have an escalated play. The players are smart. They're gonna say, okay, you're not gonna call this. Okay, I'll take care of it myself. Yep. And, and, and I'm going to be honest, the reason I referee that way, like, because I was that type of player. If, if y'all allow somebody to hit me with an elbow, I'm pretty much going to make you call an elbow foul on the other end because I'm going to put the guy in the third row. So I watch out for players that, that mimic my attitude on the floor. So I, I look for a whole bunch of Eric Lewis's out there. <laughs> so you're a dirty you were a dirty player. <laughs> it wasn't a dirty player, but if you I'm let joking. me get hit, if you let me get hit, I'm gonna do yeah. some hitting. <laughs> I do, I agree. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question really quick? This is Mike Hill. Hey Mike. Hey, uh I, I wanted to know since the foul is on blue, what would the what would the call be? Could it could it be a legal screen or a block based off of what it's intended to do? Well, it, it is a, a rebounding foul. Like, the ball is loose. So you can't have an illegal screen because that would be on the offense, right? Or oh, I'm right. not sure your rules. I'm, I'm, for us, that's a loose ball foul. No team Mark, control at all. What, what is the call on that play? This would um, go back to the uh, original thing. Block. It's a shot. So there's no possession. Go, go, go further back. Is that where we, is that where it started? Yeah, rebound off a rebound. So, the, blue Donovan shot the Peter, ball. Blue, blue shot the ball. Blue, blue okay. shot the ball. Blue shot the ball. Donovan Peters in in high school, this would be um, since we don't have loose ball fouls in high school, um, this would be a no team control foul. And if they uh, white was in bonus, you would shoot one and one or double bonus because nobody had uh, team control at this time at the high school level you would shoot a uh, bonus at this, on this particular situation. It's Thank called you, a blocking Donovan. foul in blue. Thank blocking you, foul, Blocking foul is acceptable. Push or bump, it's, it's, it's definitely an MP. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a body check. We don't have body check fouls, but it's, it's a body check. Uh, but blocking would be probably the correct uh, signal or push would be the correct signal. Can I, can I say something? This is Josh. Go ahead. Um, I, I, would, I would call it a block simply in my mind um, just because he's not in legal guarding position. He has his back towards the player. Um, so um, that's not legal positioning for him um, for him at, uh, as a defender. So, uh, so Yeah, call. but what if, if, if that was a rebound at the basket and I, and I butted somebody out with my butt and knocked him down, what would you call on that? <clears throat> Because that's basically what he did a box out. Yeah. I, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but, but in high school, when if, if, a, if a team has control of the ball, when they shoot the ball, do they lose control or do they still have control of the ball? On a shot, you lose team control. Okay, my fault. Um, but, but I, I mean, I, I just call it a block. I'm saying, yeah, it's, it's, you, you don't, it's no wrong answer here. It's, it could be a push. Semantics. Yeah, mm. it could be a push or a blocking foul. Yeah. It's, it's, just it's, just don't, don't call a hold or a hit, okay, <laughs> right. which we've seen a lot. <laughs> so you can go push or, or, or with your mechanics push, or you can call a blocking foul. 
But um, it can't be a legal screen because a team has to have possession for a screen to be illegal. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Lewis, this is DeWan Strickland, St. Louis. Um, I got a question. How yeah. would you deal with your crew partner if after the game he had a problem with you jumping in from the lead of the slot to grab it when he didn't because he didn't want to call anything on that? How I would, would just say, that? hey, I'm sorry, but we needed that call for the betterment of the game. And I, I apologize if I offended you. But I would say, if it happened to me, I hope you would come and get it for me because that's a clear miss. Okay. That's a very difficult situation at the lower levels. Again, Kenny, um, that question comes up a lot with, you know, dealing with veteran officials that, uh, you know, sometimes you got to come get these calls and to deal with them in the locker room is, is very difficult. I mean, uh, obviously you don't have to deal with that, Eric, but you know, it's, it's just very difficult for them at the, at the, at the lower level, at the, lower levels or whatever you want to call it. But well, also, you know what, a, a lot when there, there's always, so if Joy Crawford came in front of me, like nobody would say a word. So there's always dynamics on a crew based on levels of experience. Experience. So yeah. if Joy Crawford was the lead and he blew that foul. I don't think when you get in the locker room, nobody would say a word. Absolutely. Now, if that was my first year and I did that, to a veteran referee, I think they would say something until mm -hmm. they got the play, then they would go, you know what, thank you. Thank you for coming and get that play. Um, but we, like NBA referees, we know we work as a team. And if you get that play, like our, our discipline knows, like if you came to get it, you just help the crew. So we first, first thing we say is thank you. Now when we go in the locker room, we see that it's not a foul, then we may break rag on you and, and, and haze you, you know, but on the floor, we, we, th we say thank you because sometimes we know, like I know if I'm looking at the ball and something happens, I go, oh, what did I miss? And then you come and get it. I go, ooh, I'm glad you came and got it because I know my focus wasn't on those two players. So we know because we train so much at it, we know when we not focus where we supposed to be. So we more than and that's a difference. And, and that's the difference between being on this conference call, and I know it's limited, versus not. You know, there's people that are veteran officials, 30, 40 years, whatever, at the high school level, you know, small college level that don't want this. They just want to officiate they have for the last 15 or 20 years. Yep. And that's the problem with the younger officials or the veteran officials that are trying to get better. They're trying to reach out and get this right. That's the problem. The worst mindset you can have is that you don't make mistakes. Now, and, yep. and the reason I say that, we train at this, we train at this like every day. Every day, every game we have, we all watch our own games. Okay. And then the crew chief, we do watch film with the younger referees a lot. And we make mistakes and we watch film all the time. Even right now, we have to break down 12 quarters every week and send them in to the league office to show that we still engaged and ready to work right now. So high school referees don't have the luxury because of, you know, I guess video, some schools can't afford it. You don't get the luxury of getting a film out of your game to go back and watch to see your mistakes. So since you don't have that luxury, a lot of times you don't know the mistakes you made. So, Very true. So you can't sit there and think that you don't make mistakes. And if you do that, that's, a, that's like the worst mindset you can have. Well said. You're not actually looking at yourself. And that's the culture we're trying to change with Mark, you know, dealing with San Antonio and we're trying to move it on. I know you've got stuff in Florida going on, more stuff like this. Uh, like I said, you know, you got your campers. Let them join in next week or whatever. I know Mark has something going on every week. You know, let's just try to change the culture so we can get more consistent yep. and, you know, you know, be more uniform on, on all these types of plays. I mean, this is this is a great conference call. I mean, I, I cannot imagine. I mean, I didn't referee that long as, as much as uh, Eric did, but I cannot imagine this back then. It's just a great tool, great, absolutely great tool. I did have the luxury of being around, you know, major Division One referees in my area, NBA guys, and I did seek out uh, 
them as far as how to get better and they broke down tape with me. So they actually showed me how to do these things. You know, I, is this a, the stuff I'm talking about? Is I haven't made up one thing at all. What I did was I found a way to relate to how I think. So when I talk about 70, 30, they probably told me it's a, another way, but I, I, I use it the way I can understand it so I can remember how to, how to use it. So I, I haven't made anything up at all. You developed your own philosophy. My own that's language. Key. Exactly. Yep. My own language. Exactly. And that's, that's what everybody else on this conference call has to do. You know, you're going to get stuff from Mark, from Eric, from Bill, and anybody else. You know, uh, Trey Maddox is probably going to be on, uh, Mark Davis, whatever. You can't just, you know, there's going to be some conflict, but you got to develop your own philosophy on how you want to get plays right. Yep. And that's the key. So, uh, so I, I give you, I, I took this from Ed Rush when I first met him, like my second year uh, refereeing, I went to coast to coast, second or third. And he said, there's three types of contact. There's defensive contact, there's offensive contact, and there's incidental. And you referee him in this order. You referee the de defensive player first. And once you determine he's legal, then you move on. If you determine he's illegal, then he's responsible for all the contact, so the foul is on him. You don't have to worry about nobody else. So when I look at him first, he's legal, I go straight to the offensive player. And if he's illegal, then he's responsible for the contact, I go offensive foul, or I may pass on it because that, that illegal contact wasn't enough, in my opinion, to call an offensive foul. Now, if I look at the defensive player, he's legal, I look at the offensive player, he's legal, then I come to incidental margin. So I can't penalize both either guy if they're both illegal. So if they both illegal and the play looks ugly, I'm not going to fall into the ugly because they both were legal. And I so again, we go, back, we go back to a checklist. Yeah, it's back to my checklist. Exactly. So, that, so if you have anything to take away from all of this, hour and a half, two hours we've been on, it's a checklist. Develop a checklist. Mark, you're the instructional chair. Maybe we need to develop a checklist for high school officials. Yeah. We do it. Yes, we do. Yeah. And the last thing I'll tell you is, you know, I was an observer for 15 years with the league, and, and it, was a, it was a pleasure. We broke down, what, four plays, Mark? Yep. And we've been on almost two hours. Two hours on plays. Think about that. Yep. Now think about how many plays there actually are in your games. Just a question. Just All right. always, always keeping an open mindset and always learning and wanting to get better and not, not allowing yourself to be comfortable and content with what's going on. Because that's when we start messing up and missing plays and we lose why we, why we started refereeing in the first place mm -hmm. and start worrying more about getting paid and not the game and not our partners. Because you have guys showing up, if the game is at 7 o'clock, they showing up at 6.45, 6.50. Instead of like saying, hey, man, let's meet at 7.11, we ride over to the game together, and let's talk basketball and get there early. Mm -hmm. See, all that is, is not going out the doors because everybody's gotten busy. So it's more about me just going to get the game and get my money than it is about the game. And that has, that has, we have to get back to that. So we can start talking more about basketball and, and, and learning more and, and, and helping the younger referee out. You know, I miss riding to the games. And, like, I'm in Daytona, so we had a game in Orlando. I rode with the crew chief, or all three of us rode together, coming from the same area. And they, they taught me a whole lot just doing that. Now everybody's riding in their own separate cars and not talking basketball. So... Oh, yeah. Mark, any closing mark? Any closing remarks? Thank you, Eric. Uh, Thank you, I appreciate Eric. you guys. This is great, man. It was and, awesome. Uh, just keep me posted. I'll jump on even if I'm not the head guy. I would love to be on. I missed the one with Bill Spooner, which I I watched it. It was great. I watched it. It was great. So, we do these every Sunday, Eric. Every Sunday, our high school chapter jumps on, and we just again pick three or four plays. And we talk for an hour and a half, two hours. We get carried away, but. It's what we love to do. Trust me, I jump on. I like like Martin knows, man. I'm. Just, 
Well, I do all my work in the middle of the night, though. I get online on Facebook and I comment on plays. You won't see me too much throughout the day, but you'll see me 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. East Coast. I, I, wake, I wake up with a bunch of alerts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you know just like, this, this is what I, I do. I'd like but to thank are, our brethren from all across the, the nation and other nations. Um, that, to me, that, that's huge. Yes. So it's nice to see people from across other states and other, other, other countries. And, I, and I'm honored. I appreciate you guys having me. Great I'll job. I'll tell you right now, you know, there's, like, there's, there's about 100 guys on here, 90-something guys Mark talked about. You know, like I said, I, I was honored to work for the league for about 15 years. And these guys are the best. Uh, and they are very humble. They are willing to give back. Uh, Eric is on all kinds of social media just trying to help, even though he gets frustrated like I do with some of the comments. But you know what? It is what it is. But it is where our state of the union, I guess you want to call it. But with people like Mark and these types of you know, webinars or whatever you want to call them, we're going to make a difference. We're going to, we're going to get more, a little bit more consistent and we're going to close that gap. If, if you guys can do with that, but um, Eric, that was a phenomenal uh, conference call. I mean, just four great plays. And I hope everybody just has some kind of takeaway. If it's not multiple things, I hope it's one thing. And um, we'll have to hear from Mark and see what he has to say. But uh, Eric, you're more than welcome every week. I mean, I, I think Trey, we're going to send Trey, the uh, Trey Maddox, um, this uh, video conference, and he just wants to feel comfortable, which I can understand. And maybe both of you guys can get on, and I'll, I'll check with Bill, and we'll go from there as well. Perfect. I'm on Sunday, so I'll be watching. Um, everybody be safe. Is we it Sunday are... or Saturday? I know I screwed up, uh, Eric. Uh, with everything that's going on with my kids and the house and everything, I thought it was Saturday versus Sunday, but it's uh, usually on Sunday, right? Correct, Mark? Okay. Yeah, usually on Sunday, but whatever works. You know, the time is everybody's at home now, so whatever works for the math. We're flexible here in San Antonio, I can tell you that. Okay. And everybody be safe out there. Do what they ask you to do. Um, you know, it's, it's just an unusual situation in this world right now, but uh, I, I wish all the best to everybody's families out there, okay? Yes, yes sir. Yes, indeed. Likewise to everyone. Everybody be safe. Mark? Thanks. Yep, thanks. Uh, all the comments you'll see in Eric, everybody's thanking you for your time, so we really appreciate you jumping on. Um, yep, I appreciate everybody. I really thanks. do. Thanks. All right, God bless. Be okay. safe. You guys. All right, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mark. All right, take care. Appreciate it, Mark. No problem. You guys take care. We'll talk to you guys soon.